Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Florida-friendly landscaping educational program. And may the 4th be with you today, and also with you for any liturgical people um, out there. Today, we are going to discuss something a little bit different, almost the opposite of what I normally teach, but not really, because as we know in life, not anything there's nothing black and white and there are some gray areas. So where I normally talk about attracting wildlife, sometimes that is not a practical uh, solution for certain types of wildlife. You just can't, you know, you may not be able to work out a, um, you know, equitable situation between both of you sharing your property. So, I'm gonna be talking about deterring wildlife, but still you gotta remember you know, who I am. I am the attracting wildlife lady. So I'm not going to uh, discuss, you know, some people come to um, me or to extension wanting to know how to get rid of snakes. I'm gonna tell you right now, I'm not gonna talk about how to get rid of snakes. I don't find snakes um, a problem. Now, if I walked out my front door and there was a six foot, rattle diamond rattler snake right there i would probably fetch my husband who would probably dispatch of him but in general i maybe got a black snake that lives that does come to my front door and he scurries away when i go out the door um, we both scurry away our different directions snakes take up a niche you know if you have a non-venomous snake uh, living on your property leave him there because you don't want you know, if you get rid of him, then a venomous snake may take his place. I would rather have snakes any day than rats, I can tell you that, or mice. So, you know, I'm not going to be in this program telling you how to get rid of snakes. But in general, um, we're going to start out first in general how to avoid some of the unwanted wildlife. And then I'm going to talk about maybe four very specific one of them on this picture here, wildlife and in dealing with them if they're causing a problem. I am Lily Browning. Um, I work for Hernando County Utilities. I'm the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program Coordinator. Here is my email if you would like a PDF copy of this program, even if you're watching it recorded, still go ahead and email me. Just tell me which program it is, say the Deterring Wildlife Program. You'd like a PDF copy of it. And um, email me at lillyb, L-I-L-L-Y-B, at hernandocounty.us. And also, if you have any follow-up questions as well. Here are the nine principles of Florida-friendly landscaping. You know, it's kind of, you, you might wonder, how am I going to fit these principles into a class about deterring wildlife? Um, you'd be surprised. Right plant, right place is going to fit in very well, as well as watering efficiently and fertilizing and of course, managing yard pests responsibly, all of that's gonna fit in. And of course, attracting wildlife, even though we are trying to detract, unattract wildlife. So as I said in the beginning, we're just gonna talk about general um, things you can do for any kind of unwanted wildlife, unwanted critters that might be trying to inhabit the same space um, that you have. First of all, we need to remember they were there first. In general, you know, these creatures um, were around and, you know, and to create our own habitats, even as careful as we try to be, we're going to destroy somebody else's habitat in the process. And, you know, they get displaced. So, but we need um, to think about why are they in my yard? And this tie, this tie, this slide is entitled Habitat Modification because when trying to deter unwanted critter, critters in your yard, the most effective and the cheapest way to do it is through habitat modification, changing whatever it is in your yard that is attracting them. So you, that's what you got to ask yourself. Why are they here? They wouldn't be here if something wasn't being provided for them. 
And as we mentioned in classes, when we're talking about attracting wildlife, we talk about all the time, if you want to attract them, you have to have the correct habitat. And what is a habitat? It's food, water, and cover, you know, for that particular species. Well, obviously, if you are attracting um, animals that you don't want to be in your yard, somehow your yard is providing one or more of the parts of a habitat, food, water, or cover. So we need to, you know, look more into that. So there are three steps in habitat modification. Number one is identify the species. What is it that's coming here and causing this destruction or eating my plants or you know, whatever it's doing that um, you don't like? What is it uh, exactly? What animal is coming and doing this? Step two is once you have learned what it is, you learn their habitat preferences so that your yard, you can modify it, you can change it so that you are not providing those preferences for that animal. And step three, obviously changing it. Go ahead and change it up then. So it is not you know, the habitat that they prefer. Sounds simple when you put it like that, but sometimes there's a lot of research and trial and error that may go into those three steps. But as I said, I'm going to talk about the other things you can do, but really the most effective is that habitat modification. And one of the ways, <clears throat> what, what is a habitat? Again, food, water, shelter. So let's start with food. Shut down that buffet. When I tell you how to attract um, wildlife, I'm always talking about having uh, seeds and berries and, you know, or the birds and things like that. But if you have, there's nothing wrong with having fruit, but if you have some fruit trees, this is a persimmon for anyone wondering, um, if you don't pick up that fruit when it falls, something else will. And believe it or not, that something else might be a coyote. They are not 100% carnivores. That is why there are so many of them. They are omnivores and they are, you know, kind of like raccoons in that um, they're not specialists and, you know, they're survivors and they can survive on anything. So, you know, one of the biggest or something really popular right now are the food forests or permaculture, you know, in your yard where you're growing so much of your own food in your yard. And I'm all for that. But it always, in the back of my mind, I'm concerned with people who want to go that route that they will keep it clean. It, it's a commitment <laughs> to have a food forest or to have you know, a permaculture type of yard because you gotta keep that cleaned up because if you're not picking up the uh, fruit or whatever type of edible product might be getting on the ground, or even if it's not on the ground yet, if you are not diligent in getting it first, something's gonna come along and get it. And that's something could be a rat. There are fruit rats out there. I mean, they're not far from your house. They're, they're hanging around. And also, um, if you're talking about deer, install plants. Deer don't like, that's, that's so hard. But don't worry, because at the end, um, we're gonna get to a few plants that deer are not overly fond of. And again, in shutting down the buffet, um, go out and see what's being eaten, eaten. But here's some probably the simplest things to do in this um, entire presentation. In, uh, if you have pet food outside, that is just not a good idea. Um, you know, if you have dog food on the porch, uh, cat food on the porch, you know, coyotes, rats, raccoons, possums, armadillos, they love it. I mean, that is very healthy stuff. And, you know, it's just being presented to them on a silver platter. So of course they're gonna come, that's going to attract them. Um, even on screened porches, that may be too much of a temptation for them to try and, you know, they're gonna smell it, they're gonna wanna get it. So even 
not just the bowls you leave out with open food, you don't want to leave your bags if you go and get those tremendously huge bags of dog food and um, you leave them on your porch. Mm, probably not a good idea. They're going to smell that. They're going to try to get into that and get it. So um, your garage or uh, like a trash can with a lid, you know, a plastic trash can with a lid, keep it in there that that is the dog food bin. Uh, or a big plastic bin, you know, to keep it in something that's going to contain it a lot better. Also, that would help with if you're living in outside um, summer mold and things like that, too. And I know there, this is a very touchy, touchy, touchy subject. Um, there are feral cats, and, you know, they're just part of what's going on. So if you are someone who feels like you should feed them, Keep in mind, you're feeding other critters as well. And I'm not even going to get into the debate of, oh, I'm not going to let a living thing, you know, starve or anything like that. So I'm going to go ahead and feed them. And even if you do the trap and, um, you know, spay them and then release them, feral cats are hunters. They're going to hunt and, you know, they are a danger to wildlife. All I'm saying for this program is if you leave cat food outside, something other than the cats is also going to uh, consume it. Um, and your bird seed, we all, and that's part of my program, feeding the birds. Um, I had last year a potential, a possible, I never saw it, possible rat situation that I'll tell you about. But the company that I called uh, was trying to blame my bird feeders, and I'm not quite sure about that. But of course, um, they do like bird seed. And Jim Davis is the uh, county extension director here in Hernando County. He talks about taking a walk at dusk and seeing rats on his neighbor's bird feeders. So, you know, you do have to wa watch that bird seed, make sure it is just the birds eating it. Yeah, that brings up another issue. I'm also not going to tell you how to get rid of squirrels. I mean, I don't panic over squirrels. To me, squirrels are, are part of nature. Um, they're not icky like rats. And um, they don't carry diseases that get in your house or things like that. Um, they might get in your roof. But um, so, you know, just be careful. Keep an eye on that bird seed. And just like the pet food, don't leave um, bags of bird seed outside or on the porch. That's just something else to attract them. If they're hungry enough, they're going to want to eat it. So again, have a plastic bin to keep that stuff in as well. And mount the bird feeders up high so you know they're not as accessible. A rat really can climb almost anything, but it's worth a try. And even that extra bird seed that gets thrown all around, if the squirrels don't get it quickly, you know, clean that up, break that up too, and throw it out. Also, your outside trash. And it is suggested, the University of Florida suggests to use a wildlife proof can. And they do have such things um, in Marion County, in Ocala. Why? You know, Ocala National Forest, they border Ocala National Forest, they have bear issues. Um, they have bears going through their neighborhoods, so therefore they have bear-proof garbage cans. We don't have that on a large scale. If there's a bear going through a neighborhood here, it's big news. Yeah, I mean, it's um, Ocala National Forest, last I heard, has about 300 um, bears living in it. And the Chazowitzka uh, Wildlife Management Area here has 30. So, and where bears get in trouble is the young men in a, the forest, in Ocala National Forest, the young bears, uh, when the older bears won't let them um, choose a mate <laughs> among what is available there, they will somehow or another, they know, there's some ladies over in the Chaz that I'm gonna go visit with. I think I'll go make my home over in the Chaz. 
it's really amazing because that really helped the fact that they know they're there and that um, that helps with that biodiversity with you know only 30 bears being in the Chazowitzka. So the young guys will try to get there. And, and that is where the issues come in because there's um, homes <laughs> between here and there. And so unfortunately they don't, well, you know, they often don't make it. So um, that's probably all that they're doing is, you know, out looking to make a family and um, it becomes problematic with homeowners. So they have very specific trash cans that the bears can't get into. We're not going to have that problem once they, if they do make it here, they stay in the woods, they go find a lady in the Chaz. So our cans, you know, we are assigned trash cans pretty much here. You know, if you have trash pickup um, by Republic, we are given those big 96 gallon cans, which they're pretty big. So a bear, sure, would get into it but probably other wildlife is going to really struggle to try to get into that trash can. If you do have a problem, you know, check with Republic and find out, is it okay if, if you put like a cement block on top of the lid? I think that should probably just, you know, solve the problem right there. Um, another thing is I see many, 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 many blue trash cans as I'm driving around right outside the garage. And I know we're in Florida, we don't have much storage spaces, so the garages are packed. So, but try and carve out a little space in that garage for the trash can. It'll be a lot safer for that trash can to remain in your garage, um, you know, during the rest of the week. And um, if you are having issues, I put mine out the night before because I'm not having any issues with my trash can and wildlife. If I started to, I would just do it that morning, you know, as I'm getting ready to go in the car to go to work. I'd push it out that morning so that it's not sitting out there overnight. Those are pretty common sense and easy tactics um, to handle. Oh, another thing, you have a party or something and lots of kids running around, you just, um, try not to leave any food outside and you may you may in your mind think it's going to be okay something's going to eat it well that is what we're trying to avoid here is attracting something that may that maybe that you don't want especially meats you know um coming to eat it so don't so pick up any food that's left around but something we may not think about as much is cleaning that barbecue grill after each use can you imagine the aromas and that that will be attracting. So I don't like the idea of any mice or rat feet pittering around in, <laughs> in my barbecue grill. So make sure you clean that up really well after each use. And, and here's the thing, you know, we teach composting. And um, if you compost right, <laughs> and use one of these enclosed bins. This is the exact kind of bin that we give out. This is mine, so excuse the, the, the sand <laughs> up on it. But I have had no issues with wildlife trying to obtain the compost that's inside of this bin. Uh, the lid is hard for animals to open. Um, it's all enclosed. Now I have a relative who had this bin who did have issues with raccoons. And raccoons are really smart. So what she ended up doing was uh, putting a cement block like on, on here on the door so that they couldn't open it and having some cement blocks there in front of the door and then like on, on that little sliding door. Also, um, if you put in the food, if you take a compost class from us and you put in the food that we tell you to kitchen strap, kitchen scraps, say that five times fast, um, and, but no meat products, no dairy products, no animal products whatsoever, except for eggshells, you are a lot less likely to attract uh, critters that you don't want. Also, once you put in a layer of kitchen scraps, if you put in some carbons over that, meaning leaves, pine needles, 
shredded paper, something like that to cover it up. Um, that also helps avoid any kind of issues with critters and your compost as well. Now we talked about all the different food to remove. So the other parts of habitat um, are shelter as well. And see this kind of the opposite of what I teach you in attracting wildlife when I say to provide shelter. But in any situation, in any, you can have your yard certified as Florida friendly. And I promise you this yard right here would not <laughs> be certified because um, it has to, the number one rule is that it has to follow the rules and laws of um, the county or its HOA, and it has to match the aesthetic of the community. So occasionally what will happen is uh, people who don't wish to comply with code enforcement rules try to use Florida friendly as, you know, uh, an excuse saying, oh, my yard is Florida friendly. No, it's not unkempt. It does not equal Florida friendly. So that being said, um, we want you to mow high. I always preach mowing high, but not this high. <laughs> Three and a half to four inches, not this high. So, you know, and there are sometimes I'll tell you to attract wildlife, have some areas little areas probably in the back where you don't mow because then you're going to get some butterflies and caterpillars and things like that. But in general, keep your yard very tidy. It can be Florida friendly and very tidy as well. Keeping the yard clean. Um, you know, out here in the country, a lot of people have uh, cars they're working on one day, <laughs> boats, things like that. And, um, you know, things pile up and the, all those things that pile up and all that stuff that piles up could be great homes for unwanted wildlife as well. So cleaning up goes a long way towards getting rid of critters that you don't want. Um, I always say to have brush piles if you want to attract uh, lizards and birds and things like that. But sometimes in some issues, if you see you're attracting the wrong wildlife, if you see you're attracting rat rats that you don't want, mice don't bother me. Field mice don't bother me. They want to be outside. You know, rats certainly do bother me. So um, it might be time to clean that up for the moment. Sometimes we have to clean stuff up to get rid of the wildlife we don't want. Try again later for the wildlife that we do want. If you have wood piles, it, it uh, you know, it's always like the old fashioned uh, picture. You see them stacked against a log cabin or something. Well, here in Florida with termites, that's not something we certainly ever want to do. It's putting dead wood up against our house. Um, put it further away from your house. Um, and the best thing is to get it up off the ground on a rack and stack it up very, very tightly. Uh, so there's not as much spaces in between for, for things to live in. Now that I picked on the unkempt yard, I'm gonna pick on the people who are overly nice to their yard. Um, if you're over watering, and you have a very wet and lush habitat, that's like an open invitation for, you know, the wildlife you may not want. What will happen is if the ground is saturated, a couple of things are gonna happen. All the invertebrates, all the bugs are gonna move towards the surface to get away from that saturated ground and make themselves more known to critters who may want to consume them such as armadillos um, and moles. Also, moles and other ground burying creatures, if it is way, 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 way too wet, they're gonna move up closer <laughs> to the surface to dig their tunnels. And evening watering as well, because um, that's when a lot of those critters come out. 
So that might not be something if you irrigate efficiently. See, I told you some of these principles are going to work in this program um, and just give the lawn exactly what it needs and don't create a swamp out there. Then um, you know, you'll have an easier time and won't be attracting as much unwanted wildlife. Now here's a interesting thing to do and it's risky, it's a gamble, but providing distraction food. Um, and I would only do this if you already have a pretty significant problem, whatever animal it is that you don't want to be there you know, is coming after the plants that you don't want them to. So maybe plant something that they really like somewhere else in your yard, and that would be, you know, the sacrifice plants. As I said, that's a risky strategy. You don't want to do it if you're not having a major problem, because then it could invite a major problem. But if they're already there, they're already occupying your land, you may want to distract them. What I have here is Indian hawthorn. It's a uh, shrub. Here's Lubbock. So if they're going after something that uh, you don't want them to, maybe if in a different part of your yard, you plant a nice row of Indian hawthorn and say, here, chew away. Um, you know, that might be a strategy, but of course, keep in mind, that could be a risky, that one's a gamble. Now there are deterrents. I mean, you can go online and find all kinds of things, people trying to sell you all sorts of things. If the habitat modification is not possible or it isn't working, we're gonna find in this program that is what is going to work is a diverse strategy. All of these things in combination and switching it up. So, but if it, if the habitat modification is not working the way you want it to, the next step would be these deterrents. Just remember, they're so temporary. You might scare whatever it is you don't want there for a very short period of time, and then they're going to just see it as part of the landscape and ignore it. This showing here is a pretty interesting kind of deterrent that they call it a balloon, but it's more made out of a beach ball material. I would not recommend the use of mylar balloons or any other kind of balloons because that's going to be a while, you know, an ecosystem problem later. But this, this is a scary looking like beach ball balloon that is supposed to, um, because it's something different, they're not expecting to scare some of the wildlife away. Might work for a little bit. <laughs> probably won't work for long. Here's another deterrent. Um, this is like mylar material, like strips of mylar. And when these type of deterrents work, if you already have a good population in there and you put something new, you're not going to scare them away. That's just their, their place and they're used to it. So if you notice at the beginning when they're starting to come, you might scare them away with some of these deterrent methods. Or if for some reason you're able to anticipate that you might have a problem putting this up first, we'll keep them away. You know, they'll come and they will like check out the new place, but there's something there that they don't like. So maybe they'll move on. Um, step two is to switch other tactics frequently. As I said, one, doing one thing is not going to work for very long. Um, so change that habitat. Try these different um, harassing deterrents that kind of scare them away. And one of the things is you want to, um, I think the next one, yeah, that works on different senses of the animal, not just something they see that scares them, but something they hear that scares them. These mylar strips here, um, that is something they see and the light's gonna bounce off of it. If you get enough of them, that may be, you know, like, oh, what is that? 
And also it's gonna make noise. See, there, there's two, two senses that you are dealing with there. But switching the tactics up, changing them around. And this, um, one of my brother-in-laws made one of these, these Japanese, I uh, can't remember what it's called, deer scarers, <laughs> you know, something like that. It's, a, you know, um, with the bamboo and the water going through it and the weight of the water going through knocks the bamboo either on a stone or sometimes how it's made together. So it creates a, a boom sound, a knocking sound, and the sound of the water um, and the movement. So you've got sight and sound going on. But then again, something this, so this lovely and peaceful and refreshing is probably not going to scare them away for very long at all. It'll just be part of the scenery. But, you know, you got to keep, just keep trying different tactics. Physical barriers, I think, um, are probably the most effective that there is out there. If we're talking about an urban yard, basically your best um, defense is offense. Um, you noticed a chain link fence or uh, one of the vinyl fences, something like that. That's going to keep, uh, you know, at least deer and things, uh, coyotes out of your yard. Maybe not some of the digging critters, but that is one of the best defenses <laughs> is a fence. And then there's also uh, bird netting. And they use that on fruit trees. It's, you know, bendable, obviously it's netting. You can put it on shrubs. Um, the three quarter inch mesh is ideal. It's lightweight, pliable, nearly invisible. So it's not gonna be something ugly in your yard. And you, but you don't wanna use it much thinner than the three quarter inch because then birds and things could become entangled in it. That's something uh, to look for. They do have something called temporary deer fencing. It looks like this um, behind here in the picture. The neat thing about this is you can string it up as a fence by itself. You can attach it to a fence you already have, or it's pliable enough you can use it like netting to be to drape over plants. So that might be something you know worth looking into if you're having a terrible problem. This may work with uh, rabbits as well. And more physical barriers. If you, you have specific plants you really want to protect, like seedlings. So they make these seedling tubing, looks like chicken wire. It's probably a little bit softer that you can. I mean, it's not incredibly attractive, but it gives the plant a chance to grow up. And you want to get it to where, when you first put it around the seedling, the tube itself is like a foot taller than the seedling, so it has room to grow. Now, you know, they make noisemakers, pyrotechnics, meaning fireworks, firecrackers, uh, screamers, horns, bells, whistles. And if you want to go all out, you can get one of these pro propane cannons. This might be something that might work for a farmer who has 200 acres. I seriously doubt your neighbors in your urban, urban yard are gonna be pleased with you employing these tactics, especially the cannons. I mean, I'm sure there's a noise ordinance in your neighborhood. So, you know, these are not really that big of options for us. So, um, some people have alarm calls, meaning that might work on some birds, makes different noises, um, you know, may make birds of prey noises or things like that to try and keep them away. Just like any other of the tactics, these are only gonna work for a certain amount of time. So again, we need to keep upping our game, keep switching it around. But as I said, don't try this at home, <laughs> not in an urban neighborhood. This, I think, along with the habitat modifica modification, exclusion, meaning a fence, this is one of the number one ways <laughs> to deal with wildlife that you don't want in your yard. 
dogs are a great deterrent. Um, I wouldn't get one just for that. Um, because, you know, a dog is part of your family. Um, it's a big commitment. But if you have a dog that goes out in the yard, obviously it will to, you know, do what it needs to do out there and you know, run for a little bit and play. Not only seeing the dog, but the presence of the dog, the odors of the dog do work um, in keeping a lot of the wildlife out of that area. They do make chemical repellents. You can find tons of them. And here's a publication about them. Um, and what, you know, they work in different ways. So here's a different um, sense. The sense of smell is usually what the chemical repellents do. And it can be urine, uh, pheromones, you know, things they don't like, um, or even just you know, the smell of uh, different peppers or things like that, that they may not like. Um, again, it's expensive, but can be somewhat useful a little bit um, in combination with all these other methods. But remember, it's gonna be washed away by the rain and its effectiveness depends on many factors, including the availability of other food items. What does that mean? It means how hungry these, these, these animals are. The stage of growth of the protected plant, if it's growing a lot and which makes it more, very attractive because you got all that tender uh, new growth, which is yummy, um, but it's also shedding away, you know, the repellent that you put on it. The, how much wildlife is already around which limits you know, the critter's choices. And also if it is a you know, normal buffet that that critter is used to going to, it's gonna still keep going there. It's only really gonna work if, if um, the situation is new for you and the critter. I can tell you things that won't work. Devices that say they produce vibrations like in the ground, those don't work. Ultrasonic noisemakers that humans can't hear, scam, it doesn't work. Um, for a lot of the tunneling um, critters that we don't want, fumigants, no, they don't work, probably could be illegal. Tunnel flooding, really, in Florida? I <laughs> mean, think about that, that's, it's not gonna work, it's gonna seep through the sand. Mothballs and tunnels not only do not work, um, that's illegal. Um, it is illegal to use anything as a pesticide that is not labeled as a pesticide. And mothballs, um, I don't know anyone who has had a sweater or anything eaten by moths since I was probably five years old. So, you know, we have different materials now, but that might work in, in, in closed spaces, doesn't work inside, and that's putting a lot of ammonia and pollutants, you know, in the ground. It's just not a good idea. Now, this last one is a backtracking and um, what we have learned over time. Because when I, years ago, when I first started working um, with extension, I would hear master gardeners tell people, well, you will have less problems with armadillos or possums if you control the insects that they're trying to eat. The problem is we have learned since then that broadcast spraying your whole yard so that there's no living critter in there is absolutely not the thing to do. It is, you know, it is a terrible thing to our environment. We want you to spot treat only where you have an insect problem. So that is, you know, it's too risky for everyone. It puts poisons out there that your wanted wildlife, your pets, you know, you walking around barefoot could be in danger of, and um, just not a good idea all the way around. So now I'm going to discuss a, a few very specific um, 
critters that I, I hear about, either I've heard about or I've experienced. And of course, coyotes are one of them. Um, I belong to, you know, a neighborhood group in my neighborhood, which is rapidly developing, but is still, you know, pretty much out in the woods compared to some areas of the county. So coyotes are a frequent topic. And, you know, how did coyotes get here? Well, first let's discuss uh, this sign over here. You know, you don't wanna be feeding the coyotes. Don't feel sorry for them, don't feed them. And this sign here kind of brings that home. It's saying warning coyote area. Coyotes are wild animals and can be dangerous. dangerous. Do not encourage them to approach you. Never, never, never feed the coyotes. And they would like you in this particular uh, community to contact animal control. Don't do that here. <laughs> they don't wanna hear about wild animals here. Um, you can change that to the Florida Wildlife Commission. If you see dangerous coyote activities, such as carrying a box marked Acme, dropping anvils from above, painting a large landscape, detonating explosives or TNT, holding a detour sign or in possession of a catapult. If you see those things, you may wanna call FWC and report the coyote that you have seen. They um, originated in the deserts and prairies of Central North America and Mexico. We're used to them being an out West thing in our mind, but they did expand from the Great Plains in the 1940s. Why? Why did they end up all over the country after the 1940s? All farmers moved in. They were there before that. I mean, the uh, Dust Bowl was before that. So what happened is we changed the landscape. We humans did it. So it was more to their preference. It wasn't all woodlands anymore. Um, and that's their preferred rangeland rangeland habitat. And also what did the farmers not want around? They did not want wolves around who are also, you know, in competition with the coyotes. So, you know, we changed it and they started expanding, probably started being seen in the 1960s in Florida. Today, they're in every single county in, in Florida. Um, the interesting thing is that they, the ones that are over here on the east are bigger than what we have in our mind of the, you know, the, the silhouette of the coyote howling at the moon. Um, and probably because they hybridized with the red wolves over here. So I hope you uh, follow, you know, the caution of this sign we have here and be very careful of coyotes. But for real, we really do have coyotes here. I remember um, in the 90s, you know, I hadn't seen coyotes, hadn't heard of coyotes being in Florida, even into the 90s. And my sister bought a house from someone who referred to the coyotes that may come in the yard. And at that point, I thought, okay, this lady's crazy. <laughs> then I found out later, oh, no, no, she wasn't crazy at all. You know, there are coyotes here now, but attacks on humans are extremely rare. They don't want to, you know, mess around with you. They don't want to expend their energy on something bigger that can beat them. Um, as I said, the ones we have here are a little bit larger because they've hybridized with wolves. Um, they're active at dawn, dusk, and through the night. In my neighborhood, if I go out right at dusk, and listen, I mean, you can hear neighborhood sounds, you can hear domestic dogs, but right at dusk, I hear this very specific yip, 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 yip. And that is, that is the coyotes waking up. Um, they can be a threat to livestock. A lot of farmers have uh, taken to having a couple of donkeys because the donkeys will alert. Um, well, you know, we'll alert them that will cause a ruckus if there is a coyote around and they'll fight them. Um, 
and small pets. That's the main thing you need to be really concerned about is your small pets, your cats and your, you know, your small dogs or even your medium sized dogs. Anything that isn't bigger than them or even, you know, bigger dogs might end up um, getting pretty beat up in a fight with them. But that's not what they're looking. They're not looking really to get in a fight. They want something to eat. I have two little tiny eight pound doglets is what I call them. They have a fenced in area. It's only a four foot fence. So yeah, the coyote would kind of have to be pretty hungry if it's gonna get close to my house and jump the fence, but I'm not gonna take that chance. So when I leave them out at night, I'm out there with them. I mean, they're not out very long anyway, just to go do their business and, and come in. When I take a walk a couple times, I've done this in the evening and I've started out too late so that we're coming back in the dark. And we do have a lot of woodlands still around us. These poor dogs don't know why, but once dusk hits, I retract, you know, they're expanding leashes. So they are beside me in the middle of the street. I don't let them go off into the grass or near the woods at all. And you know, I make a lot of noise walking. I'll turn on my uh, audible so that you know there's a voice talking and I'm listening to a book and I keep them right close to me at that point. Again, the same rules we heard before, don't leave the food outside, secure that garbage, um, close off crawl spaces under porches or sheds or places like that for them to hide. If you see them, if they're you know, gonna be hanging, if you happen to see them, um, they're seen everywhere now, golf courses, pretty much everywhere. But if you see them and they're concerning you, you can run at them, stomping your feet, raving your hands, yelling. You know, you might look a little foolish, but that is how to, um, you know, make them get away <laughs> from you. Now, here's what they really look like. If you are... If you are wondering here on the right, not everyone is gonna look exactly like that. They can be different colors and um, you know, they look like a dog, but every time I've seen one, something is going to like, you're just gonna know, you're just gonna have that sense that that's not a dog. It's not acting like a dog. You, you can sense the wildness in it. Generally, they want to stay away from you and they're going to, you know, scamper away. They can be different colors. Some of them look pretty skinny and mangy and just have that wild look in their eye. Um, and if you're looking at prints, you know, around your property, I found this pretty interesting. So here's what a coyote print looks like as compared to a domestic dog, kind of more oval. But also, um, look, they don't have the, the dew claws that a dog does. They only have the claws up at the top and closer together. So, you know, something to keep in mind. So let's move along from the coyotes to armadillos. I included this one because I have recently <laughs> had an armadillo um, issue at my house. They can be found anywhere, but they prefer dense shaded cover and easy to excavate sandy soils, which is what I have. They can live to be eight to 12 years old, believe it or not. Here's the interesting thing about them. And I did, you know, some pretty, I researched this quite a bit because when you hear something like they, they can carry leprosy and they can affect humans. I checked that with the University of Florida, expecting them to say, Either it's never happened or it's rarely happened. And they say it's happened like maybe sometimes, you know, not common, but not unheard of that they can actually pass leprosy onto humans. I don't think it's happened in Florida, but it's happened in Alabama and Mississippi um, at least a dozen times. So, I mean, the, the, they, they carry the leprosy virus and they can pass it on to humans. They don't pass it on other animals. They can pass it on to each other, but not to other species except humans. 
So the easy answer to that to me is don't touch an armadillo. Don't eat an armadillo and you won't have to worry. But also keeping in mind, we have natural immunity to leprosy at this point in our country. 95% of us, even if exposed, are not going to get it. But still the easy answer is don't touch an armadillo. Um, they're not native, believe it or not, but they've been here a very, very, very long time. So they're considered naturalized. Something else interesting about them is when they give birth, they give birth to four clones, four identical, um, same gender and everything. Um, each time they give birth, they, they start with a, a twin cell, you know, already a split cell, that's what they have in them. And then it splits again. So they always have four and they're always clonal. Pretty interesting. Here's uh, what happens you know, if you wanna control them. This is my yard. <laughs> and this is what I recently found where they've been digging. And what's interesting to me is everything I looked up said, oh, like I just told you, if you're providing that lush over water, you can see I'm not, <laughs> but, um, it is that dry sandy soil that's in that's easy and I have a lot of brush around my my yard so you know they're living in there and just this particular time of year they come out and get whatever is yummy. I'm not doing anything I'm waiting for them to just move on and go away. I'm not overly concerned about it. But you know ways you can handle that are you know remove pollen fruit like we said before exclusion. If there's a very particular area, you don't want them around. Um, but for them, you have to put the fence in the ground, at least 18 inches, as well as above the ground. You can lay chicken wire down where you don't want them walking around like your plant beds or something. Here's the thing about trapping. It's useless, <laughs> in my opinion, because here's the thing, you're allowed to trap them, any animal, armadillos or any, this applies to any animal, you can't relocate them. You're not allowed to relocate them. You're allowed to trap them. You're not allowed to relocate them. That leaves one answer, really. And also there's only very particular ways you're able to humanely dispatch of them and, um, you know, the most humane way would be with a bullet. Again, back to those noisemakers and things, you know, look at your, the ordinances in your neighborhood. Most likely you are not allowed to discharge a firearm in your neighborhood. And the way that uh, Florida law states is that trapped animals, they have to be destroyed. Humanely, you can't poison them. You know, you can't torture them in any way. So unless you, you know, know how to do it very quickly. And that usually involves shooting them, which you're probably not allowed to do in your neighborhood. And I am not inclined to do. Um, you have to do that or release them on the same contiguous property. Most of us have a half acre or less. That's going to accomplish nothing. Maybe if you had 500 acres, <laughs> you might accomplish something that way. So trapping is out as far as I'm concerned. You have to try, you know, other methods because I'm not gonna shoot them. <laughs> so rats, as I said, I, about a year ago, um, I heard overnight some scratching going on in my roof. That was not a pleasant uh, evening, did not sleep the rest of the night. Um, called a pest control company who of course worked off my fears and you know had me convinced they were rats even though they never produced a rat they said there was droppings up on the roof I mean in the attic I'm not going up there to look I'm thinking now maybe it was a squirrel that moved on but regardless um rats are around we have two different kinds we have the Norway otherwise known as the old world rats came over on the ships with the pilgrims. We have roof rats, um, otherwise known as fruit rats too. Rats are, they 
use any method at all to get food, water, and shelter, that habitat. They can climb anything. They're good swimmers. You've heard of sewer rats. What they don't like is open spaces though, because they're always wanting to hide. The biggest thing we did um, that, that the pest control company did for us is put some hardware cloth on um, the air conditioner duct that goes from the outside to inside. They say that is the um, space that people forget about because our home is fairly new and was fairly well enclosed, but there was that one opening. Shortly thereafter, we had to get a new air conditioner, a whole new air conditioner. And I made sure I told um, the people that came, put this hardware cloth back over that hole. And we haven't had any issues since then. Again, don't leave pet food out. Um, I like this rodent proofing thing here. Like I said, the hardware cloth. Um, predators, leave your snake friends out there. That will help with the rat issues. Sanitation. And of course, if you can get neighbor cooperation to clean up their areas too, that's always most helpful. Before we go, we're going to go into dear oh dear, our, our, our dear old dears, because um, a friend of a friend, um, and I hope she watches this on the recording anyway, um, a friend of a friend, I guess, may, makes her my friend, who's always asking what about to do about the deer. She lives up in uh, a really wooded area in our county. And so, Deer feed on hundreds of different plants. That's what makes it so difficult. And really the best populate, the best control is population control. Since we over the years have done away with their predators such as the panthers or the wolves or severely limited them, bears, things like that. The best population we control we have are hunters. Um, that is the best way to handle it. Did you know that deer are responsible and I'm putting that in quotations for more human deaths a year than any other animal. If you're having a hard time wrapping your brain around that, deer do not attack you. Um, it's the auto accidents that they cause. That's why I put responsible in um, quotations, because again, tra tracing it back, it's not their fault that their habitat has been taken and you know that they jump out in the roads. Um, you can confirm deer presence if you haven't seen them around by uh, their tracks or their droppings. Because of the way their teeth are made, they leave a clean cut surface where they chew on the leaves. Also, if the you know damage is five feet tall, you know, it wasn't a rabbit <laughs> that probably did that. The answer to dealing with deer and I know many people who see deer every day and they have so much vegetation in their yard that it really doesn't make that much difference. They're willing to share. Um, but if you're trying to grow something like a vegetable garden or, or fruits or whatever, harvest it as soon as it's ready, get it off the vine and get it for yourself. Um, and plant these things as far away from wood cover as possible. None of these critters like open areas. You know, they, they want that place for cover to hide. So put it out in the open. And just like before, when we talked about that Indian hawthorn bush, the deer love it. They also love hibiscus. You know, it's maybe something that they love. Set that aside away from what you don't want them to have. And maybe they'll go over there and use that as, as the sacrifice zone. There are these frightening devices, the ones we talked about, um, like that beach ball balloon thing and the noise making. Again, they're just temporary. You gotta deploy it at the first time you see a deer eating something you don't want it to. Same with the pyrotechnics and the noise makers. Dogs work pretty well. And again, the repellents, eh. Exclusion was really, really the best source. And a lot of people ask me all the time, um, what can I plant that deer don't like? So I found this um, from the University of Florida and I've called it plants that deer don't like as much because there are extenuating circumstances. 
I don't like Brussels sprouts. I'm not going to eat Brussels sprouts. Not going to happen. If I didn't eat for a week, I bet you I'd be eating Brussels sprouts. So it's the pressure, um, you know, whatever's going on in that community. The deer may go after plants that they don't normally go after. They're going to go after their preference first, but if they're hungry enough, they may still go after these. Keeping that in mind, what they don't normally go after would be bottle brush, sable palms, great myrtles, loquats, live oaks, magnolias, or yopon hollies. Uh, some of the shrubs they don't you know, normally go after would be banana shrubs, bird of paradise, bottle brush, camellia, this pretty thing here, Chinese holly, crotons, gardenia, ixora, juniper, oleander, plumbago, or wax myrtles. And some of the annuals that they're not overly fond of would be uh, aloe, black eye susans, bush daisies, Cone flowers, like we see here, uh, blue lily of the Nile, any of the lupine uh, family, marigolds, peace lilies, petunias, any of the sages, that's interesting, shasta daisy, turks cap, hibiscus, verbena, or yucca. So, you know, maybe if you fill your yard up with those, and maybe even then surround. Maybe if you have a prize hibiscus or something, possibly surround it with these type of plants and maybe the deer won't notice it as much and then put some sacrifice ones further in your yard where you don't mind if they go. Here are the resources that I used and there's many of them um, for, this, uh, for this program. And here are the links where you can find them. As I said, email me. I'll be glad to send you a PDF of this so you can find these links. Also, if you wanna talk uh, more in detail about this, about your specific problem, or there's a critter I didn't mention that you wanna talk about, if you call uh, one of the master gardeners, this is Bernie and he's there on Thursdays. I think many of us have met Bernie. Um, he'll be glad to talk to you at length about your particular issue and here in Hernando County, and here's their number, 352-754-4433. If you're listening from somewhere else, call your county extension office and they should be able to help you as well. Oh, before I get to that, this last one is a book you can buy at the IFAS bookstore. Um, it's a $30 book, but it, you know, it has a lot of information in it. I just love the name, Pests in and Around the Southern Home. I mean, it's very specific of what it's for, but if you think about it, it also sounds like a great Gothic novel, doesn't it? Pests in and Around the Southern Home. I like that. Here are upcoming classes. Um, next week, I'm teaching an in-person class at the Spring Hill Library, so we will not have a 10 o'clock Zoom class on Monday. The day before I do have an in-person rain barrel workshop in May, I only have rain barrels. The compost bins, there are none available. Um, Carmen is working on ordering them. So I hope that you know, they should be coming in soon, but there's not gonna be any available in May. Um, the same class I'm teaching at the Spring Hill Library, Landscape Care when it's hot and dry, will be taught in this manner, a virtual class on May 18th. So it'll be two weeks before I see you in this manner again. May 25th, Dr. Lester is gonna be joining me for getting to know your irrigation system. We're gonna be concentrating just specifically on the irrigation system. Then I'll have a virtual rain barrel workshop in the evening, just rain barrels, Carmen hasn't got me any compost bins. Hopefully we'll have them in June. Um, that's an evening class and the pickup for the rain girls will be the next day here at Hernando County Utilities. Then June 1st, we'll have a Zoom class on 
um, planet, pollinator plant starter kits. Just uh, very simple, easy plants you can get to start pollinators coming to your yard. Again, here, here is my email, lilyb at hernandocounty.us. So please email me if you have any questions or if you'd like a PDF of this program. And it is, oh, 11.06. And um, I'm waiting on a rain barrel um, delivery myself, so I need to get going. But thank you everybody for joining me today and we will see you again soon.